Let us understand Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley was one of the major English romantic poets. He is among the finest and most influential lyric poets. He is best known for his poems such as Ozymandias, Ode to the West Wind and To a Skylark. His other major works include The Chenchi, Queen Mab, Adonis and Prometheus Unbound. Let me first tell you a little about Ozymandias. Ozymandias is a shattered, ruined statue of a once powerful king. It is situated in the desert wasteland. Its face bears arrogant and passionate expressions. There is a monomaniacal inscription on it and that inscription reads Look on my works ye mighty and despair. Monomaniacal person is one who is fanatic in his beliefs. He is so obsessed with his own ideas that he does not care about other people's concerns. Inscription means some text that has been carved on stone. Something which is engraved. But the once great king's proud and boastful declaration has been ironically falsified. Ozymandias' works have crumbled and disappeared. His civilization is gone. His kingdom of power has been turned to dust by the destructive power of history. The ruined statue is now merely a monument depicting man's hubris, conceit, arrogance and pride. Hubris means excessive false pride, haughtiness, a feeling of self-importance. The statue expresses how excessive false pride and vanity eventually get shattered. It makes a powerful statement about the insignificance of human beings in context with the passage of time. 
Ozymandias teaches us that political power is temporal and ephemeral. It doesn't last forever. Temporal means temporary. It is significant that all that remains of Ozymandias is a work of art. Through his sonnet, Shelley demonstrates that art and language long outlast the other legacies of power. And now a line-wise explanation of the poem. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, The word antique means ancient or very old. The poem begins with an encounter between the speaker and a traveller from an antique land. We don't know where this encounter is taking place. We are not even sure about this traveller. He could be a native of this antique land or he could just be a tourist. The mention of a traveller is the promise of a story. The first person narrative lends it a personal touch. Instead of seeing the statue with our own eyes, we hear about it from someone else. It implies that the once powerful king has no authority over us. This impact is also created due to the huge distance in time. Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. The traveller tells the speaker about a pair of stone legs that are standing in the middle of the desert. Those legs are huge, expressed by the word vast, and without a torso, expressed by the word trunkless, means they do not have a body. The giant ruined statue lay broken and eroded in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. Visage means face. The head belonging to the sculpture is partially buried in the sand near the legs.
just like the rest of the statue the head is also shattered the image described is very strange makes us wonder as to what happened to the rest of the statue whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command the traveler now gives a more detailed description of the shattered visage lying in the desert it isn't completely shattered a frown a wrinkled lip and a sneer are still visible we still don't know whose statue it is but we do know that he was upset about something because he's frowning and sneering maybe he thinks that sneering makes him look powerful Ozi Mandias had ordered his own image to be carved which is a reflection of his egotism It conveys the cold command of an absolute ruler He can do what he wants without thinking about other people he could command the sculptor to make the statue but he could not control art because it was the sculptor who gave the cruel expressions to his face tell that the sculptor well those passions red the sculptor was able to perceive finer aspects of the ruler that he himself does not understand the statue does not literally speak anything directly but the frown and sneer are so perfectly carved that they give the impression that they are speaking which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things stamped means sculpted or chiseled the poet now tells us more about the passions of the face depicted on the statue strangely these passions still survive because they are stamped on these lifeless things the lifeless things are the fragments of the statue in the desert stamped refers to the artistic process by which the sculptor inscribed the frown and sneer 
on the statue's face. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Mocked means made fun of. It also means copied or imitated. Hand is that of the sculptor who copied this man's passions and also belittled them. The heart that fed refers to the heart of a human being nourished by various types of passions. It could also refer to the pharaoh's feelings of the heart that fed the sculptor's creativity. The passions have not only survived but have also outlived both the sculptor and the heart of the pharaoh who has been depicted by the statue. A contrast between life and death has been drawn. It is ironical that the fragments of the statue, the lifeless things, still survive as they exhibit the passions of the pharaoh. But the ones who were living at that time, the sculptor and the statue's subject, are dead. And on the pedestal, these words appear. The traveller tells us about an inscription at the foot of the statue which finally reveals to us whose statue it actually is. My name is Ozi Mandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. It is the statue of Ozymandias, another name for a very powerful pharaoh, Ramesses II of Egypt. The inscription suggests that Ozymandias is arrogant. He calls himself the king of kings. The king's message, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, is an ironic indictment of his pride. The pedestal told mighty onlookers that they should look out at the king's works and thus despair at his greatness. He means to say that his works are so magnificent that any attempts to equal or surpass their excellence will end only in despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. Colossal means extremely large, enormous or gigantic.
nothing else remains at the site of the sculpture. Nothing except for the head, legs and pedestal. The traveller tells us that it is a colossal wreck. The pharaoh's boastful statements are now as empty as the empty and boundless desert surrounding the decaying statue. The size of the statue is colossal. It emphasizes the scope of Ozymandias' ambitions. He is the king of kings. He had to build a really big statue. It is the only thing in this desolate, barren desert. The sands are lone means whatever else used to be beside the statue has been destroyed or buried. The dilapidated state of the statue symbolizes not only the erosive processes of time but also the transients of political leaders and regimes. Analysis of the poem It is common for people to seek immortality and to resist death and decay. All that Ozymandias achieved has now decayed into almost nothing, while the statue has lasted, braving the storms of time. The artist is more powerful than the king, as the only things that survive are the artist's records of the king's passion carved in stone. But poetry is more powerful and lasting than all because it will outlive the power of the pharaoh and the workmanship of the sculptor. Poetic devices used in the poem Alliteration is the beginning of multiple words with the same letter. The traveller calls our attention to the barrenness of the desert through alliteration. Boundless and bare, lone and level, Sands stretch are some examples. Cynic docky is when one part of any object or entity is used to describe the whole. In the poem, heart, which is a part represents the pharaoh. Second example of a cynic donkey is hand which represents the sculptor. Enjambment is a technique in poetry whereby a sentence is carried over to the next line without pause. A shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. The phrase whose frown begins the enjambment here. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck 
boundless and bare. Round the decay begins the enjambment here. Anastrophe refers to the inversion of the typical word order in a sentence. Well those passions read from the poem is an anastrophe. Normally it is read as read those passions well. Extended metaphor is when an author uses a single metaphor or comparison throughout the poem. The, the fallen statue of Ozymandias is a metaphor for the transitory nature of individual human fame and achievement. Irony is a statement that may actually mean something different or the opposite of what is written. The irony here is that the statue was sculpted along with the inscription on the pedestal as a symbol of great everlasting power. Unfortunately, that power did not last and now there is no evidence left of the Pharaoh's greatness. From the poem, we learn that time has the power to destroy both political power and legacy. Art is the only thing that withstands the test of time. Real power often lies with the artists and the creators rather than the rulers and the leaders. Thanks for watching. If you liked this lesson, please press the like button and subscribe to my channel.